for instance. Uh, well, maybe I have talked too much about uh, uh, the challenges, but I am confident that we can overcome those challenges uh, by working together uh, at international as well as uh, local level. I can tell you about uh, one interesting uh, thing that happened with Unicode. When Unicode started, in fact, people thought it would be very, very difficult to have all the scripts uh, and alphabets on Unicode. And uh, I can say one person almost single-handedly has been made possible for a lot of scripts to be on the internet. This is Michael Everson, who has worked with uh, a lot of organizations. And if he can do it almost single-handedly, I think that uh, uh, all of us can do a lot of things in this area. Uh, I believe that the exchange of experiences are important, and I also believe that it's important that we have this kind of fora where we can share experiences, but also evaluate what we have done until now. Uh, I'm sorry for having taken a, a long time, but I hope that we have some time left for discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dawid. And if you allow me, I will move to the podium because for the Q&A session, I cannot see you all from here. Analyst, um, this is a very important issue and I think that we have heard very interesting experiences um, going, uh, for example, QSI mentioned about the importance of the tools of the browsers and the multi-stakeholder multi approach to solve all these problems. I think Nia made an excellent point about talking about libraries and the role of these community places to have access. If, you, if, if some people may have not access at home, if they can find a community place to share information, this is really important. And I can tell you that this is working very well in Argentina, in places where people go and, and share uh, internet access and content, especially content for the use it, uh, used by a small and medium companies that need some tools for developing their businesses. Um, then we, we heard from Rajesh uh, an excellent example of the usage uh, of the role of the government. Uh, for example, he mentioned about the voting process and the voting forms in different languages. I think governments have a major role in, in incorporating uh, their, the local languages into the internet and into the e-government uh, tools that people used. Uh, David um, made a excellent point about the role of universities in the development of local content. And I can tell you an experience that I have done with my own students. Spanish is a language that, as you know, in Argentina we speak Spanish. It's a language that has some presence in the web, but I encourage my students not to make written uh, uh, works in my uh, professorship, we, we develop content and we, once we, we decide that it's okay, we put it in Wikipedia. Uh, so we enhance uh, articles that are already presented there, or we start new articles that were not present in Wikipedia. So they share this knowledge that they were able to develop in our professorship with all the community and its content developed in Spanish. And I have some other students from Brazil and from the region that they can use their own languages as well, because Wikipedia offers this. Uh, this possibility, and then I think that would make gave us an excellent ex uh, picture of what is happening in Africa and the the role of of the different tools and what important would be to know this observatory observatory concept that he explained. I think it's, it's very important and. We have some time for, for question and answers, and I would welcome if you, if you want to make them. And, and once you make them, if you can give us your name and where are you from. And if, if the question is, is done for a special panelist or for the whole panel. So we're open to that. There. Is there a microphone on, 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 the, on the room? In the room, sorry. No. 
Less of a question, more of a comment based on some experiences that were mentioned. Great. My name is Subaya. I am originally from Singapore. I'm of Indian origin, and I actually work at, in the United States. I'm, a, uh, I'm still on sabbatical from Stanford University as a professor. I'm also a professor at uh, Singapore University. I'm Tamilian, which is a state in the south, and uh, my claim to be of interest in this is I was one of a group of a couple of people who helped invent IDN back in 1998. In fact, the term IDN, the exact term was coined by me. And uh, this was at the National University of Singapore in 1997-98. And uh, some of the stuff that the, the panelists mentioned actually interrelates with something that we did back then. At the time in 1998-98, uh, ICANN was getting started. We went to ICANN from Singapore, because Singapore has several languages, Tamil, Chinese, we have a large Tamil population. So we went over to, uh, when, we, when we invented this thing called IDN, or at least helped make it work, I myself was roped into it by my Chinese friend who was supposed to be here, but he canceled because of the Bombay thing. He's the true inventor of IDN. I helped, assisted him. He realized that, that, that he told me that there was a need for IDN. Now, I'm a speaker of two languages. I didn't buy it myself. I said, look, English is good enough myself. <laughs> Until I realized, okay, one day I woke up and said, no, there's no way, you know. So I bought into this. Now, I was originally a professor of biology and biophysics and biochemistry, okay. So we switched to the internet, and eventually we decided that we went to ICANN. ICANN told us to get lost. CEO, it's a documented, you can go back to white pages, go learn English. That was the answer. First inception, first ICANN meeting in Singapore. Chuck Gomes might be a very signed chief. He knows, he remembers. He's here somewhere. But the, so this is what we're told. So the Asians, we said, look, we can't worry about all the other languages. We'll stick to Asia. So we ran a test bed for one year. We came to India at the time because Tamil was important to me because Tamil was the second language that was tested in IDN after Chinese. Okay? We came to India, but there was not much interest in India. We couldn't get the NIC interested at the time, the predecessor to the current organization. But there was interest in Japan. Uh, even Sri Lanka, China, and a bunch of places. So we ran a test bed for one year. It was a very extensive test bed. There were several workshops all over in Korea, Japan, everywhere. Everybody learned from us, okay? And it was very exciting. And eventually, because I, there was no ICANN interest, the idea was to deploy without ICANN, you know, to work with ISPs, local, regional ISPs, and start doing this. So we started doing this, and uh, very signed bought into this, and this went on, okay? As part of that effort, we went to many countries, at the time, there was no interest. No. We went to many countries, uh, including India. And I was personally motivated because Tamil is a 4,000-year-old language. I speak it very well. And I wanted to do something about it. And uh, I arrived in India. And this is where it, it, it meets with the, the, the stuff that uh, Rajesh was talking about and also David was talking about. We arrived in India. And what we discovered very shortly was that in India, is, you know, it's 18 states, so you know, whatever, different languages, official languages. Every state had 30 encodings. <laughs> You know, every little font maker had made one, and a local found out that CDAC had produced, had a list of all the 30 different software makers and fonts, and they had their own version too, in all these 18 languages or whatever, okay? And the problem was, what do you do? You can't do IDN without having settled on a single encoding. But this is, you know, prior to Unicode becoming an established standard, okay? But we were working with Unicode as mm -hmm. well at the time. So we realized that what we had to do was to educate state by state. The necessity, forget IDN, the necessity of getting down to just one encoding that you would agree. So we decided it was too difficult to work with everybody. So we stuck to Tamil because Tamil, the state of Tamil, Tamil Nadu has a close relationship with the Singaporeans who speak Tamil and the Sri Lankans. So in order to promote this effort to get it down to one encoding, we, I personally, worked with the Singapore government to raise a few hundred thousand dollars to start a group called INFIT, which is the Tamil diaspora across six countries that spoke Tamil has spoken. They worked together, and they were very active for eight or nine years. And they had hundreds of thousands of people turn up for their conferences. They developed tools. They developed all kinds of things. And they were part of the instrumental in the process of reducing the number of encodings down to one or two. Okay? And so you know, this was funded by the Singapore government. We got, you know, every year there were conferences, and the local host brought their ministers to attend and so on. So this took a lot of effort. And INFIT worked very hard. And there were papers published, thousands of papers. And so this was done under the national radar. It wasn't really up in the north in India. It just happened. It was just a community-wide effort. Okay? Now, this model was then picked up by local states, Karnataka, which is, speaks local, next to Tamil Nadu. And they came over to learn from us. And eventually, they also worked in two or three states in the south, worked on reducing. And they worked back with CDAC, trying to reduce the number of fonts and encodings. Okay? So th this, 
And th at that moment in time, we, we as a company, which was a National University of Singapore company, were interested in launching everywhere. We launched in China and Korea and other places. So we did talk to many ministers at the national level. And in fact, we did launch with uh, the predecessor of David's company, Satyam, which was an ISP that agreed to patch back then in 2000. We launched with just one ISP patch, not everybody. And we worked with three languages. We, the, 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 you can go back to check on the web. Uh, the, the, the information minister of India launched the Hindi version uh, Pramoch Mahajan, the local chief minister of Andhra Pradesh, launched, uh, and the one here, uh, uh, this Hyderabad, Chandra Babu Naidu, he launched it. It's on the web. It was launched. But the problem was this. It didn't take off. This is before ICANN's interest. It didn't kick off. These IDNs at the time didn't take off. Well, we understood there were not many people interested at the time. But we wanted to start early so that early on you will bring in. What happened was the, the, the problem was this. The problem was the tools weren't there, IME wasn't there, plus the ISPs were so focused on the English-speaking population, they were not interested, there was no monetary incentive, so there was no real interest at the time, you know, tools, no interest, and from the government sector, there was no, we couldn't find any real leadership, you know, of trying to address this problem of 18 languages. We understood content was the issue, all these things, and you should get started early, okay? We spent over a million dollars in this country, and we failed. In the meantime, we worked in Korea, China, a number of other places where there was some interest, like in China. Okay? They took an interest, and by 2003 and 2004, they decided not to wait for ICANN. They deployed IDNs, patched government order. It's been working for a few years. A you know, few hundred thousand domains, they're okay. They're, they're doing it. 300 million people doing it. Other countries took interest. Korea took interest. So whatever the countries that were interested, Israel took interest. So the countries that were interested were able to go forward. I mean, in, in the case of India, I understand there's you know, different languages and it's very complicated. Still, I want to wrap this up by saying that, that we 11, 12 years later, uh, 10 years later, sorry, we're still at the stage of finally it's happening. There is, you know, we're talking about standardization. We want to get these scripts going and so on in the Indian context, okay? But the problem is that why did it take so long? The reason is twofold. One, I can show disinterest for 10 years. This could have been done a long time ago. Okay? Everybody knows this. Okay? They, just, they said they would do something, they wouldn't do it, then they would do it, they wouldn't do it. This went on. I mean, I raised the first 20 to 30 million dollars single-handedly to push IDN around the world and indirectly another 30 or 40 million. The reason that the word IDN is now understood everywhere is because of a lot of marketing and advertising. It, it got here. Okay? Okay. So, but the failure is, well, ICANN, for various reasons, did not want to promote it for 10 years. There are more important things to do. That's number one. But it's not just the Western fault. It is the fault also of the countries that were ready and prepared to do something about this, right? Were able to do something about it. So it's also an, an issue in many countries, like da David says, you know, that you know, people find it more attractive, the local businesses, local government finds it more attractive or more incentivized initially in the early stages to actually support something else, not so much the multilingualization. Okay. And that's the reason I think that, 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 so it's both a combination of both Eastern and Western influences that's forcing this problem, you know, and uh, anyway, I just thought there'd be an interesting perspective because I think it's just the beginning, it's the tip, you know, of, of all the other things and content and so on, but it's taken this long even on that effort. So unless there is clear leadership, both in East and West, you know, and within, within the countries themselves, both commercial sector and the government, you know, together working with the West, you know, then it happens like in China or Korea. But elsewhere, we, they all had the same start when we started okay. this at that time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you have pictured, pictured the role of ICANN, the role of ISPs, the role of governments. And I agree with your comments. It's a process that, that it takes time. Uh, because we, we usually work in, in different silos and we don't interact in between others. This is the purpose of the IGF. I don't know if our panelists would like to comment on, on this comment, especially about India or something, or we ask for another question. Okay. Uh, yeah, there are many. Um, who's first? Because we don't have, we have like 10 minutes at the most. Okay. My name is Siva Subramanian Muthusamy. I'm from ISOC India Chennai. I'm also part of At Large. And uh, I'm the Alak uh, liaison to liaison for IDNs. There are several positive uh, aspects about uh, IDNs and multilingualism. But uh, have we considered uh, that uh, one negative aspect is possibly, I'm not sure, 
possibly that we are moving away from a common language, from a global language, and uh, that uh, uh, the possible uh, shortfall could be that uh, we are moving towards uh, isolated networks, uh, and, uh, a network uh, that belongs to a particular language, where content is created by local users and uh, accessed only by those local users. Uh, for instance, if my friend from Africa uh, today wants to upload some document, he would be doing it in English, uh, which is mission translatable. And um, with IDNs and multilingualism, if he uploads the same document, uh, which is a valuable paper in terms of knowledge in Swahili, the people in Africa will benefit from that. But that knowledge is in danger of uh, being lost for the rest of the world. I'm saying this uh, not as an argument against IDN, but uh, just a question to ask uh, the panelists if uh, some of these uh, negative aspects of uh, a move away from a single language is considered. Thank you. Over there. Thank you very much, Mr. Subaya, because actually, you know, what I wanted to say, you know, you, you close with that. But since it was a long uh, technical discussion, you know, the socio-political uh, aspects of it, I'd like to just reiterate that, which is what I ra raised yesterday evening also. That, you know, the whole issue is that most countries where you have multilingualism, the, the society itself is actually, uh, uh, you know, it can be classified into those who control policy, have control over resources, and control over language, which is the language of official functioning across the country. And there's a whole lot of people who are the have-nots, actually. And you know, they, they, do not, they do not command the same control on policy. And therefore, and coming back to India, I mean, for example, the English-speaking people, I mean, they control policy. And, and if, the, if computing had to start in Hindi or in Tamil today, you know, they'd be at a, at a great loss because they don't know how to type in that language. So consciously or subconsciously or whatever, I mean, I, it's just so happened that the, the, the leadership has not come about, despite India being whatever, being classified as a software powerhouse, to push and standardize local language computing. Uh, computing. I mean, this CDAC, you know, so much money is important to CDAC. But this, this lack of focus and lack of leadership has resulted in whatever gains there are not being consolidated. And so, I mean, now the idea is what can we do about it? So, and which I mentioned yesterday in the, very briefly was the time's running out, as it's running out here, that probably IGF could play a role or there should be somebody that can uh, play a role to put pressure on governments to have disclosures of what is being done for local language compete, uh, computing in proportion to the, the language groups that exist over there. For example, if, if there is a disclosure and you, know, you put together as to what has been done, then perhaps you know, some shame or some local interest groups or pressure groups might arise which might push governments to take leadership, standardize on coding, and standardize on funds, et cetera. And you know, at the, the opportunity is huge. And then perhaps the private sector can take the initiative to take everything forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we have our closing remarks from the, from the panelists. Um, I'm Ramakrishnan from CDAC India. First, let me respond partly to um, so, but yeah, I do understand that we are into the panel time. So I'll try to be more like in the one-liners and take it offline of any detailed discussion if the concerned people are otherwise. Um, partly, some of his travails are uh, two, three points. One is so-called first mover advantage. Whenever you take very early on some of these issues, it is very in inherent that you go through some of the travails. Everything has not been sorted out in a very, uh, uh, very much part of the internet story in the early on, mid 80s. So I know everything doesn't get uh, sorted out just like that. So some of it attributable to that. Second, uh, the as much a multilingualism pressure as the much wider multilingualism countries than things kind. He did mention about Singapore, I do understand, but still it's a comparatively smaller set. Third is, I guess, uh, some of the points what he mentioned much progress has taken place, good amount of progress has taken place. So I'm willing to report, I mentioned to him um, outside, 
but enormous progress has taken place. Second is another speaker you mentioned about so-called accountability, public accountability. I guess I can, one can talk about to him, my own presentation which is scheduled on IDN and many other work, it is going to be mounted uh, uh, the part of that part of the conference proceedings. One can see for that. So, the, so in, in short, this, there has been a sea change in the quantum of work that has been done. There has been varying degrees of implementation. And uh, as far as the political side of it partly, it is, it is a very important the sense of ownership has to come from the top. So sometimes it is not that easy in a country like ours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we can take most very prominently in all the presentations and I want to talk about on that because we feel on the basis of our own researches that even if the internet is multilingual, even if it, it is accessible, if it doesn't cater to the needs of the, of the daily needs, of the practical uses of the common people, it won't be, I mean, it won't be actually global and I would be talking about putting in the development of content. Uh, particularly because this is for the global perspective and particularly because the talk is prominently dominated by Indian contest and here the people, government people from India are here. So I would like to say that particularly when in India ICT is included, uh, ICT is being used for the development of rural people, particularly you people have a very good project of using ICT for rural e-governance, and I would like to have your kind attention to the fact that in India, in rural governance, there are 10 lakh women, uh, sorry, 10 lakh village heads, and there 33% seats are reserved for women, and ICT is used for rural governance. But we have found that even if the technology is available, like computer, even when technology is available with the women, they are interested in using the technology, they are very enthusiastic uh, for using the technology, but they are not using the technology because they don't find the content available through computer uh, for uh, their use, for their needs. And that is why initially the enthusiasm that was there to use the ICT they are losing their enthusiasm and willingness to use the technology. So this is my submission to the house that while making the world, while making the virtual world multilingual, multilingual the needs of women, especially uh, for the content development, should be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take the last comment question. It's more than like the comments of the panel and the distinguished audience because we have 70% of content that's available already on the internet. And while we can do a good job in creating the content from now on, are there, is there a need for focus on cross-lingual information systems, or systems that translate the content that's already available on the net and bringing it to the local languages? I know that CDAC has got a project in India which does the cross-lingual information systems. I would like to know the uh, importance of this and from the broad, larger perspective of the panel and the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much and I will... Last question. A lot of... It's in various font-based systems and only recently we see on-the-fly translation called... We shouldn't call them translation systems, but which basically on-the-fly show it in Unicode on many... Accessing the content in Indian languages or other languages becomes more easier on the net. And just one more passing comment. Uh, in public policy issues, some issues become more glamorous and take a disproportionate share. For example, in health issues, AIDS is taking disproportionate amount of funding rather than research in malaria and tuberculosis. Similarly, I feel that in most of the discussions, the IDN has become a glamour baby and taking away discussions from many more important components like content and other such components. Thank you. Thank you, David. I would like to address the point that Shiva Subramaniam had raised in terms of are we creating islands of communities and languages on the internet? Yes and no. I think uh, the reality is that what is happening on the internet is actually a reflection of what happens in real life. 
So if you have a Tamil speaking community, uh, a lot of them may not be able to speak to a Telugu speaking community. That is a reality. And it reflects cultural identity, ethnic identities, and of course the fact that they use that particular language. But over time there will be a large enough group of people who begin to understand each other or use a different language like English. So I think that is what is happening rather than our creating islands on the internet. And there will come a time with the translation software and so on, particularly with regard to important literature which other people want to access, that we will be able to read other languages. But you know, all of these things evolve over time. We can't do everything uh, very quickly. We've just heard the huge struggle there was to get the languages onto the internet. And uh, that is an ongoing process. So I think uh, that is the reality, and we all need to do our bit to make it possible. And I would like particularly to thank the professor who talked about the need for language content aimed at women. I think gender equality and uh, content for children in the languages is also extremely important for it to be used, for it to be relevant. If not, it's just going to be uh, stuff that gets put on there more from an academic point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, yeah. David? Uh, I would like to talk about uh, the leadership issue that has been raised. Uh, I believe that uh, this is not an unsurmountable problem. Uh, there are countries, as it has been mentioned, that are succeeding uh, with putting their languages online. Uh, but there is a determined leadership uh, for one reason or another uh, that is pushing that. Uh, it can come from the government and sometimes from uh, uh, other, for, for example, very important civil society that can push this, but it's very important that we have a committed leadership. Uh, as for, uh, well, it has been said, can we have uh, translation services that can help us get quickly content in some languages? Uh, that would be ideal, but unfortunately, uh, the translation services are, that are available today and probably in the near future are for those languages that are already uh, available because uh, uh, most, if you go to any online service, the translation service, you'll find, uh, for example, from English to French, uh, uh, from English to maybe to Spanish, but not from... Uh, English to Swahili or something because uh, there is very little work done on these languages. Uh, even the researchers at universities are not directed to these languages that are economically less interesting than uh, the, the other languages. So I think research is also very important. Research in uh, towards targeting the languages that are not yet well represented on the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Dawid. Miriam, your closing remarks. Thank you. Um, just, to, um, just to reiterate, we've heard a number of comments uh, this morning from the panelists and also in the questions, I think that raise the, um, or underscore the importance of the role of, of governments that's local, regional, uh, state, and also international. Uh, because the market is simply not going to uh, address a lot of the issues, including, for example, special needs, whether it's women in rural areas or whether it's people who have accessibility issues. Um, those are simply not going to be addressed by uh, the market forces that are particularly looking for uh, big commercial interest, uh, entertainment interest, um, and that sort of thing. So we really have to continue to to push for that. On the translation tools, um, again, that's going to be a really important place where the local response, the community response for people who are willing to step forward and help uh, with that is really important for getting the content out there. Um, the, the, the tools are simply not yet sufficiently mm -hmm. developed to answer all the problems, particularly for languages that are not major groups. Okay, thank you to our distinguished panelists. Thank you very much for your active...
that that community, that, that group, and there's a couple of others from Singapore, more than welcome to opinion here. We, I think that uh, it's neither my purpose or Werner's purpose here to, to, to dominate the, the speaking session as panelists, but rather to have people say whatever they want. They can come up and join us if they want, or they can speak from there. More like a group effort, group think effort, if there's anything anybody wants to say that has not been shared. But just to give this some direction, you know, uh, uh, Werner and I have a few questions, or at least central themes, that we thought we could introduce if there was a lack of topics that people could bring up to talk about in this general sphere. Okay, so with that, I will. Uh, 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 why don't I just get Werner to introduce himself first, and then I'll introduce myself. Um, good morning. I'm basically concerned with TLDs and the launch of new TLDs. And this is, of course, um, a connection to access to local culture uh, in as much as um, in the context of new scripts, um, in new TLDs, the scripts uh, in the local language um, uh, are one of the activities that um, uh, is, of course, um, uh, expected and uh, uh, where uh, the, the access to local content would at least in that respect be a little bit easier. It doesn't mean it's going to be one uh, just at, at the first attempt, but it's going to be um, uh, a removal of a big barrier, namely that of how you translate the very address of a given piece of information into a um, uh, uh, a script that is not the, one's own script and where there may even be problems of representing correctly what it is so it may be highly unclear how to write something if it is not in one's own script. However, the um, uh, context of local um, of um, uh, new TLDs for language purposes is not restricted to um, uh, the uh, addition of um, uh, TLDs in other scripts. One example, which I think has been a very successful one, is that of .cat, which you know, I'm proud to have been associated with, um, uh, where the uh, TLDs was introduced as a, a cultural and language TLD. And the result, you know, which is actually demonstrable, is that it created a, a, a lot of new content that would not have existed um, if .cat not, had not been launched. In the meantime, it has become a model, so there's a number of other TLDs that are proposed by groups um, in various um, uh, uh, cultures or, land, uh, or languages um, as a way to facilitate the, pr the production of content in their um, uh, specific language and, of course, to um, uh, also um, achieve the signal effect, namely that people realize that this is an important um, uh, uh, thing to do. In this context, you know, I just come back from, um, uh, from Lima, where um, uh, there was a, a meeting of the Latin American um, uh, CCTLDs. And uh, when I was in the city, I asked a number of people about uh, the use of one of the indigenous languages, which happens to be um, relatively strong in, in Peru, which is Quechua. And they asked um, a student, for instance, if she or anyone in, the, uh, in her faculty spoke Quechua, and she said no. And then I asked her, well, um, if her, in her family people spoke Quechua, and she said, well, her mother would always speak Quechua to everyone in the family except her. Um, uh, then I, you know, uh, discussed this with a taxi driver, and he said, well, he spoke perfect Quechua. And then I asked him well, whether his sons or daughters spoke Quechua. He said, no, they don't speak Quechua. Uh, so the, the um, phenomenon that happens there, and it probably happens in many other places, is the belief by the people who speak a certain language that that language is not desired that is, does not lead anywhere. You know, better don't teach your own children your own language uh, because they will have problems. You know, they will, uh, they will not be accepted as, as, a, as normal citizens because they speak a language in, uh, uh, that is different. In many cases, it's actually um, a, a total misconception on the part of people who believe that it's going to be troublesome to have more than one language. It's actually not the case. It's easier to speak more than one language. but. Right now, what we have is um, uh, uh, worldwide the culture of saying essentially to people it is either or. So 
in the case of ICANN, we see the same problem. When we try to become multilingual in ICANN, we say, okay, um, you have to select your language channel. We're going to translate for you. So it's either or. We don't facilitate the, 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 the cross access to the languages. Now, to illustrate how much IT could do to not just say it's either or, that even if you do not speak a given language perfectly, if you just have some knowledge of it, um, uh, you can actually get access to it and more, um, more easily thanks to um, uh, IT. I would like to show this little thing that you have on the screen here, which is to uh, make a short demonstration. I didn't write it, but I'm using it a lot. I think an American or Canadian who wrote this immature, who has been in the same situation, and he then basically just went and did a program that would enable you to find a given site and translate word by word, not the context, not the, not the meaning, just word by word, the content of it when you place the mouse. So if you're Japanese and you're on this site, you just, that's actually the site itself, you just place the mouse on a given word and it will tell you what it means. Actually, this idea of having a dictionary that will just immediately pop up and uh, uh, tell you what the word means has been taken to other places. Yeah. But typically, these people had, had, to, had to have one thing. They had to have an online dictionary. And then again, the problem is how do they get access to the dictionary? In this specific case, between Japanese and English, it has been owed to Jim Breen, an Australian who has committed well, a good portion of his time for the last 20 years in building with students and volunteers from all over the world a Japanese English dictionary. You, the, the name of this thing is Rikai, Rikai.com. It means to understand um, if it's transliterated um, um, from Japanese. So what you can do here, for instance, you can go to the ICANN site, um, type that one in, and the thing will translate word by word the, uh, the, the site um, it, uh, that you have. So it shows that you don't have um, to have a situation where everything is, is, is translated. It is just as good if you have tools that help you in the case of a, um, um, of a specific, of a specific, um, of I'm not sure if it's the, um, if it managed to work because I can have such a complicated. Yes, doesn't seem to have done it here. That's a pity, but um, um, it, it works on most sites and not too complicated. But obviously here, basically for the ICANN site, it, is, um, uh, um, it has failed. It could be, I'm using it very often the, the other way around. You can go um, uh, from, uh, uh, Chinese to English or from, from English, Japanese to English. That's what I'm, I'm uh, using it a lot for. Nikkei.co.jp. Sorry, that was a mistake. It has a spelling mistake. So here we, we see the inverse. You find a, um, a Japanese, a Japanese page, and you can actually. With the help of, of this, um, uh, the, this tool, get the, uh, the translation of a given word that, um, for instance, you have here. So it gives you the pronunciation, it gives you the words and the components that be in, uh, belong to it. Um, uh, uh, shown on TV in that language need to be dubbed in the local language. I think these are totally erroneous policies. The policies that we need to, to, to focus on are, fo are policies that facilitate multilingualism, multilingualism of the very people involved. They do not have to give up if you're a Quechua speaker in, uh, in, in Peru. You don't have to give up Spanish if you want to speak Quechua. 
no, no vice versa for, uh, for that matter. You don't have to give up Quechua if you want to speak Spanish. The multilingualism is something that is actually um, accessible to everyone, and with IT we have a lot of tools to do that. Now in the context of, um, of a policy, I think we certainly need um, uh, um, exactly the kind of people that we have in a, um, a forum like the IGF. We need governments, we need IT people, we need civil society to uh, propose policies that facilitate the use of multilingualism, basically the, the use of more than one language at once in various degrees of competence um, um, uh, for people to get into the habit of not just choosing between one another, but actually trying to follow all of them. Specifically, if you talk about the, what, what we could do within the, the IGF or, the, um, uh, or ICANN, um, is also to make the access to the specific proceedings more easy in the language in which they are produced. So right now we say, look, we do translation, it looks very good, you know, we're, but a lot of, uh, of the content gets lost in the translation or in the in interpretation. Whereas we could use IT, you know, very simple mechanisms to make that content more easily accessible. For instance, we have transcripts of um, uh, many of the sessions that are available. Those transcripts are published eventually, you know, so people can see it offline, but they would be probably most useful if they were trans uh, transmitted, you know, um, on a Jabber or a, on an on a inter-messaging system instantly when the person speaks. So the people who are not so much at ease in English, they can follow the written transmission. And everything is much easier in language if you have a written transmission at the same time. In the same fashion, if people wanted to figure out later what has been said, if they could go from the transcript, where they can do a search, to the actual voice that um, uh, said that sentence, uh, it is just a very simple technological step to do, where in the context of the, the very activity that we have here um, at the IGF or um, uh, in ICANN, we could actually show an example. We could use technology that would be adopted by other people just because the seeds used here as a way of making the cross-language um, uh, uh, usage easier. Thank you. Uh, any comments? Anyone? The CCTL, these are the country codes, C and C stands for country code, and they were issued ad hoc to every country. IN went to somebody in India, not necessarily the government, but went all over the place. And so today, we have that original set of lots of CCTLDs, and ICANN has divided the world into GTLDs and CCTLDs. And then a few years ago, ICANN actually had another round to introduce a few more GTLDs, which became .biz and .travel, several more. And now we're looking at you know, expanding that GTLD universe in English a lot more, and at the same time expanding into IDN versions, internationalized multilingual versions of both the CCTLDs, and that's the fast track process, one per country or something like that, plus also a movement to introduce new IDN generic TLDs. Okay, that's also going on at the same time. And that's what is being, as a, as a, as a, as a group being proposed. And as a whole, everything is called top level domain names, but there's this, kind of artificial, if you like, at this point, distinguishment between country codes and for historical reasons. And when you said uh, script. Makeup is an, uh, a script, basically. It takes a little bit more than just a set. Translated. You mean in this, in this specific example that I showed to you? No, no, in the beginning. So you said that uh, because they translated. I did not. I'm, I'm not talking about translating TLDs. Yes. What I was referring to is that the view I think that we currently suffer from is a, the view that it is either one language or the other, and at best we translate the whole thing from one language to another. I would call this the Hollywood style, the Hollywood approach to multilingualism. We produce the whole thing in California, and then we do the you know, Tamil version and the, the, the German version and the French version and so on, and that's supposed to be um, okay. Whereas the actual needs that people have is to understand the other language and they're not as incapable as we pretend to do so. 
even if, if people don't speak perfectly another language, you know, with a little bit of help, you get quite a bit of access. You may actually be learning it, and you do not have to give up your own language in order to learn another one. So this is one of the changes of mindset that I so, propose we should take. Um, kids don't speak Quechan? Quechua. Quechua. Wouldn't having films translated or dubbed or subtitled in a local language reinforce that language and also make it available to the older generation who doesn't speak the national language or the more common language? Well, oops, enormously, and again, it's totally forgotten, to have subtitles in the language of the movie itself. If I see an American movie, it may be very helpful to me to have English subtitles of the American movie, because I may have been unable to understand what they said, but if I see it written, maybe I stop the movie, uh, which is nowadays easy, uh, did not used to be easy. And we can nowadays select subtitles. Mm -hmm. We can move from one to another. And of course now in the context of, um, of, uh, of YouTube, we could easily subtitle many things that are available. My children spend a lot of time on, um, on YouTube, and uh, uh, some, of some of the time they actually read the, the Japanese manga subtitles in English. Now, neither Japanese nor English is part of their languages, but they get by. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. So um, uh, the, the fact of combining these things is actually um, uh, um, very helpful. Strangely enough, in the case of the manga on YouTube, it wasn't done by the producers. It was done by pirates. <laughs> so right now, it's basically language access was provided by people who were, so to speak, not authorized. Because in the authorized mode, this wasn't regarded as desirable. It was either or. Either it is the Japanese manga, or we do the, the entire dubbing of the whole movie, and we get it in German, I think or in, in English. I, and that's something we can change. I think, I think that uh, what I was trying to say is a Tamil speaker who wants to look at an English website. They're already motivated. So perhaps you don't need a total translation of everything. What you need is simple, useful tools along the way that help you, you know, whether it's the written form of the English or little pull-down tools that give you an, a meaning here and there so you get some idea, some quick and easy tools that are available to get a lot more people on first, you know, than wait for this thing where we dub everything and, you know, and, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a certainly a, a, a valid statement because I think that uh, if you were in the, in the previous uh, 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 workshop here, Rajar Zagarwal, who's our host for the event, he mentioned that only about 100 million Indi Indians speak are proficient in English, and that's a number, 10 to 15 percent. But it turns out there are about 400 million people who can actually handle some level of English in this country. Now, uh, a little tools like this might help them, you know, the next 300 million push over, you know, and I think that's a fair statement. And the other statement I wanted to make is that the, 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 regarding the Quechua that he talked about, in my own language, Tamil, uh, I made, in a previous uh, workshop, I made a comment that back in 2000, we launched some uh, ID and TLDs, uh, you know, irrespective of ICANN in Tamil Nadu here with ministers. At the, t at the, at the launch, and it's recorded, you can find the old uh, newspaper articles about it, the, my, the person who is influential, who was the head of all education for the Tamil Nadu government, you know, essentially, he pointed out during the t talk I gave, he basically said, look, Tamils are, are, are beginning to speak a lot of English now. The kids don't want to speak English anymore. I mean, uh, Tamil anymore. They want to speak Tamils. Why does it take an outsider like me? I'm from Singapore, Tamilian from Singapore. Why does it take an outsider to bring Tamil ideas? <laughs> you know? So he basically said, should we even continue? I mean, the kids are giving up. And I think the reason the kids are giving up is not because they, they're not interested. Because as one speaker said earlier, culturally, if you switch on a music, Tamil music, they start dancing. I mean, you know, no one says, I love you. To, 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 to his girlfriend in the Tamil Nadu, you know, in, in English, really. I mean, you know, there are the certain things they communicate in their local language, their name, their thing. If I meet another Tamil person, I don't say my name is Subaya. I say Subaya, which is, you know, Tamil, okay? So it's not that the reason people are switching to English, I think, is mainly because a lot of the attractions are only available in English. So people are moving, but they're keeping certain part of their identity. I think this, is, this movement is so far gone that it's almost impossible to bring them back totally back from English. It's not possible. I think that what you have to now do is, you know, let the English go on, but let, give people enough tools and things so they can preserve their culture too. So it's both, you know, and that's, and that's what the focus should be. And I think that if we're waiting for, and I think Rona is right, if we're waiting to translate everything so everybody's happy, <laughs> we're going to lose this whole generation <laughs> everywhere. So I think it's true in, you know, in a lot of places. People who have the wealth 
are now focused on English, you know, and that's the kids. You go to China, same thing everywhere. So, so you know, my own company is working with the Chinese government. In fact, one of the people who is going to be here is from the Prime Minister's office in China. And they're working very hard to not really implement e-government, you know, and there is a real serious effort because they realize there's a web search engine called Baidu, which is competitive to Google, which is very popular in China, is worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And they're fed up because Baidu concentrates only on information that is a of value to the kids, even though it's in Chinese, you know, songs and movie stars, and they don't really see a search engine that is providing needed information for the people. So they feel that government has to compete now and try to come up with a search engine that, you know, so because they, there's still a lot of China that is Chinese. Anyway, I, I, I think that things have gone on so far, especially in the internet, we're playing catch up, and uh, perhaps the better thing to do is focus on the easy things that we can do to, you know, bring people along than just wait for the Holy Grail. I think that's his point. Any other comments? Go ahead. Yes, we can hear you. I can. Um, I, I'm sorry if I'm reinventing the wheel. Um, I came and went and came and went. Creole is a very interesting language. It's spoken in the Caribbean and also in the Indian Ocean. It's a very interesting language because it came originally, we think, from West Africa and it's maintained its West African grammar, but it relexifies itself. In the Caribbean, it's lexified currently in French. However, it is in process of relexifying into English. And I wondered, listening to what you were saying since I came into the room, how have you considered the hybridization of language? As, as people are melting together, Languages also seem to be melting together, and perhaps this is another way of solving the problem. In a sense, one approach to multilingualism is to consider two languages as the same. Um, it actually happens naturally. If you look at that he was um, a child, he didn't know that Catalan and Spanish were two different languages. He'd never realized. You know, it, he, he would in the beginning probably mix them, slowly, depending on the person, um, speak fairly pure Catalan, fairly pure Spanish, um, uh, uh, but not realize that these were the two different languages. And this, this happens like that to, to many people. I think in the case of India, where people grow up with more than one language, um, uh, is actually, this is a wonderful asset to have. And none of these languages should be lost. I can say that in my own country, which is uh, special, I, I'm Swiss German, and the Swiss Germans, they speak a language they don't write, and they write a language they don't speak. Uh, because German is the written language, and Swiss German is the spoken language. And if, if we speak German, we speak it slowly and uh, with mistakes, and uh, you know, we cannot compete. Uh, it's, it's difficult um, for Swiss German to, uh, to speak German. So German is really a foreign language. And everybody has to learn this foreign language in, uh, in school. But the way things established themselves was that nobody even considered it to be the language that they would replace their own language with. So we learn German in school. They call it high German. Um, uh, and uh, you know, at the age of nine or 10, you know, most of the formal um, uh, talking in school would be in high German. but any instructions or whatever that would be um, in, in, in Swiss German. And uh, uh, nobody would, would think of switching over to, to high German. Actually, that's been very helpful for all of us to, to have these two languages. And my experience was in the, in the, in the case you know, when, when uh, people who mixed languages, um, in the beginning, they would very easily mix them. The Italians who came to Switzerland when I was a little, they would mix the, the languages. Slowly, they would actually differentiate them. Sometimes in certain groups, they would continue to mix them. And overall, they acquired by the mixing approach much higher language capability than those who were the purists. So it's probably one very good approach. I, I wanted to add one other thing, and I visit uh, every time I'm in Tamil Nadu, which is in the south of India, I count the number of, I just listen to, I get on a bus, you know, and I listen to villagers speak, and I start counting, uh, it's difficult actually, for every 10 words, how many English words they speak. These are non-proficient, rural, about as poor as you can get, okay? 
how many in words that you speak that are actually English nouns. The grammar structure set is still the language. Okay? These people don't know any English, really. Okay? They can, maybe can recognize alphabet, that's it. But the, 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 you just listen to the words. Either they already have a word in Tamil, but they're replacing it with the English equivalent, or it's only a word that's available in English. And it's easily over one out of 10. You know, so all the nouns are getting replaced by English. And I think it's true in other languages too, in French and so on, people have started doing this. So in fact, languages are keeping, I believe, keep, you know, world over, are keeping their grammar structure, which is the important part in many ways. That's how you express yourself. But the nouns are getting replaced. And, you know, and then they get transliterated into words. So like, like, like in, in, over in, in many parts of Indian languages, you will see uh, a company that calls itself uh, something, 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 you know, the name on the billboard will be company. And company is basically just a transliteration of, you know, they, they have another word in the language for company, but they don't use it anymore, okay? So, so I think that this is happening everywhere. Nouns, because new nouns get involved. The other thing I wanted to point out is that, and is this a good or bad thing? I mean, that's the part of the question you asked. I'm actually a, really a biologist originally. I'm a, I'm a genome biologist, got into internet and multilingual stuff. I actually, uh, for those who don't know, I, I, uh, until very recently when I'm in sabbatical, I actually teach at Stanford University uh, for a long time and also at the Singapore University. Both in, uh, initially, my background is in bio biology, biophysics, biochemistry. I drifted into multilingual internet as sort of a sideline. So, but, so, in fact, I was involved with the genome project originally, the Human Genome Project. And uh, so I, I brought, draw a parallel in evolution. Basically, uh, uh, to go back, why we need these languages is because we don't know what the future holds. Every language contains an idea that if it dies, we'll never get back to that idea again. I'll give you an example of Hopi. Hopi is an American Indian language. They, have the, they are very unique. They, only, they have a sense of time that is different from everybody else in the world. They, they have a, a, you know, there's only 5,000 or 10,000 people left or something. And they have a sense of time that is not marked by actual time that passes. Uh, not by, when a Hopi Indian says, something happened three days ago, he doesn't say, he doesn't quantify it as three days. He says, I, he says, well, I woke up, I saw the sun, I went to a marriage, I ate three dinners, and then I did this and I did that, then I came here. That is his quantification of time instead of three days ago, you know. So, so it's, a, it's a wholly different concept that disappears with that language and culture if you don't keep it. Now, why do I say this? Because just like in biology, you know, you need other species in case that, you know, you get, you get a disease that kills you off, but the other species might, you know, subspecies can survive and we go forward. And to draw a parallel in politics, you know, I, I, the Clinton's generation, you know, President Clinton's generation, they took off to, you know, they didn't like the Vietnam War. They all ran over to Canada. Now, at that time, it was a bad thing. They were all traitors. But today, we realize, even America realizes it was the wrong thing to have done. Now, if there was no Canada, there was nowhere for these people to run. So for every American, you need a Canada. So we do need these, these diversity of, 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 of languages because they all c contain treasures that we don't know that, that, that one day could Influence, re-influence back. English may not be here forever. You know, maybe it's Chinese is going to take, maybe Creole, I don't know. But we do need to keep these. It is important for all of us to keep the other languages alive. And uh, unfortunately, so far, the internet is not doing a good job of <laughs> making sure that people are drifting more into English, unfortunately. And that, that's why we have to recover this so that at least we can, but you know, and the, and the way to get it back is, I, th I think, through popular culture, bring popular culture back to the young. So at least through the popular culture, uh, they can access actors, actresses. I know it's demeaning some of the, the great literature, but at least that will keep the young from not drifting and at least keep the language alive to, to another time. I know, that's my thoughts. Uh, any other questions? One more on the subject or two more and then we move on. Um, hi, I'm Gitanjali. Um